Hello, Internet. My name is Quinn, and this is Blondie Hacks. I'm working on my Pennsylvania A3 Switcher locomotive build this week, and I'm going to make the cylinder covers and the steam chest cover cover covers. Co steam chest covers. Steam chest cover covers. Co covers. Steam chest. Steam chest covers. Steam chest covers. Covers. Cover. Steam chest covers. 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 When last we saw our cylinder and steam chest assembly, it was looking like this. Basically functional, but missing some decorative covers that go over the ends and the top. The prototype has these covers as well, of course, which is why we're making them. These covers served probably multiple purposes. People disagree on exactly what all they were for. Some will say that they were there to help the crews keep the machines clean, because they simplified the outer surfaces around bolt heads and other complicated geometry that would get covered with oil and grease and so on and be hard to keep clean. Personally, I think they were mainly about marketing. We think of these machines as being purely form-following function, but the truth is branding has always been a thing, and the locomotive companies very much tried to brand and market their locomotives as part of their big travel empires that they all built back in the day. One of those efforts was to make the locomotives look as clean and streamlined as was practically possible given the technology of the day. This very much drove the streamlining era of the end of steam when they were wrapping up everything with these elaborate sheet metal bodies, which were ostensibly about aerodynamics as part of the Art Deco movement, but honestly didn't do a whole lot. I don't think it was mainly marketing. I'm going to start with the steam chest covers, which are flat plates that I unfortunately don't have a good piece of stock for, so I'm going to instead cut them out of this piece of square bar that I found in the scrap bin. I neglected to order a more appropriate piece of stock in my last big roundup of ordering stock for this project. So we'll make do with what we have here. It'll be a little bit extra work on the milling machine, but that's okay. I do like using up stock that's in the bin. So as per usual, I start on the bandsaw. The art of bandsawing parts that you're going to be machining is to try and get as close to final dimension as possible, but without going under because then you have to start over. So you have to kind of learn how good you are with a bandsaw in terms of keeping it straight, and thus how much extra material do you have to give yourself to machine down and still have it clean up. On a good day, I can hit 20 thousandths on the bandsaw, and on a bad day, more like 100. It depends on the length of the cut as well, of course. On a short cut, I can usually get within 10 thousandths of final dimension and still have it clean up, but on a long cut like these cuts, I give myself more like 100. Now over to the face mill to create two nice parallel faces on opposite sides. I'm not doing a proper squaring of stock here, it just isn't necessary. I just need something that's basically square and looks nice all around and is on dimension. So after creating those two parallel faces, then I'll machine the two long edges down to final width. And then finally I'll set the pieces up horizontally and side mill them down to final length. This is a much quicker way to get a piece of stock that's basically square, square enough for most things, and looks nice. Next I get myself centered up with the edge finder. There's not a whole lot of features on these things, really. They're just a hollow shell with a hole down the center for a clamping bolt. The primary job here is to hollow out the shell to make it into a cover. It's mimicking what would be a sheet metal part, probably welded sheet metal, on the real thing, but it's difficult to make a formed sheet metal part that small on a model, so it's easier to start with a solid piece like this and just machine it out and make it look like folded sheet metal when you're done. There are several different milling strategies you can use for a feature like this, but the way I've chosen to do it here is to start with a two flute center cutting end mill, what the Brits would call a slot drill. Yes, I know you call it that. There are different names for everything all around the world. I see all of the names in my comments because turns out not too many people agree on what everything in a machine shop should be called. Anyway, I call it a two flute center cutting end mill and I use it to plunge my way down in the center and then I kind of run around the piece clockwise so that I'm always conventional milling, not climb milling, and I work my way around enlarging that initial slot until I'm within finishing cut range of final dimension. I don't go all the way to final dimension on this. I'm effectively roughing it in with this large end mill. And by calling this a roughing pass, I can go quicker, take heavier cuts, not worry about surface finish, etc. I am at final depth, however, because I don't really care about the finish on the bottom of the piece. It's going to be upside down and invisible in the final assembly. 
This is my last lap around the outside with this larger end mill. Again, I'm still short of final dimension here. And then I'm going to be finishing this up with a smaller end mill because the corner radius on the inside of these corners has to be quite a bit smaller than you see here. But you don't want to mill out this entire pocket with a tiny end mill because that would take forever. Speaking of saving time, I'm using an end stop so I can swap in the other steam chest cover. The two of them are identical in every way, so I can do all of these steps twice in between tool changes. This is a nice repeatable setup, so I just run to all the same numbers on the DRO. I don't have to edge find or anything ever again after that first initial setup. Now I come in with the teeny tiny end mill, and I do a finishing cut all the way around the outside, and I tighten up those corner radii to the final dimension. This kind of thing is trickier than it seems, because if the delta between the roughing end mill and the final end mill is too great, then your final end mill won't be able to get into those corners and clean up all of that material. You don't want the finishing end mill, the teeny one, to have too much of a heavy cut when it gets into those corners. Typically a small end mill like this isn't going to be able to plow in there at full width and clean up any size radius that you might have left in there. So imagine if I'd done this with like a one inch end mill and there was a huge radius in that corner. I can't plow through that with this tiny end mill. So you kind of have to have a roughing end mill that overlaps substantially with the radius of the finishing end mill so that the finishing end mill doesn't have too much work to do. That's the tricky balance, and a lot of that is just experience. If you get yourself in trouble, you can do a few passes with the finishing end mill to work it down to final dimension. Before I take down the setup, I'll check my dimensions. This is the steam chest cover that we need to cover, cover, cover. I'm checking width and length, and that fits. It's not going to fit all the way in yet because the corner radii don't match. The corner radii on the inner cover were hand filed, so they're probably not quite right. But I know the width and length are correct, so I can fix the corner radii later on the inner cover. And then, of course, swap out using my end stop and do it all over again. Fun thing about building a locomotive, you do everything at least twice, sometimes four times, sometimes six times. If you're building a big boy, sometimes 16 or 32 times. Next, I drill a clearance hole all the way through the center of these things, and this is a much larger hole than Kozo calls for in the drawings. And, uh, well, you'll see why in a minute. This is just supposed to be a small clearance hole for the mounting stud that holds these cover covers in place. After a little more filing on the inner corner radii, that fits in there nicely. But now you can see why I made those center holes oversize. The studs on the inner covers are made too short. I misread the drawings when I made those studs, and they're supposed to be sticking up above so we can put a nut on them. Instead, I made them flush. So instead of drilling those studs out and redoing them, I came up with this special fastener for the job. It's like a bolt, but it has a little stem that sticks down into that hole to grab those threads, and then the shoulder of the bolt seals the cover down, which I guess makes it a self-sealing stem bolt. I also put a little acorn detail on it that I later decided was too fussy and left off. The self-sealing stem bolts start with hex bar stock. Saves you a lot of work if you can do that. I'm going to turn down the stem feature first, and then this will get drilled and tapped not quite all the way through the fastener for the threads on that stud. The studs on those inner covers are threaded into the holes and silver soldered in place, so removing them and putting in the correct length ones would have been a lot of work. I would have had to drill them out. You can't just unthread them or press them out or something. And I was going to have to make nuts anyway, so there really wasn't much extra work to just modify these fasteners slightly to make up for the way my studs are. And actually, I think this will look a little bit nicer. It'll be a cleaner look than an open nut would be on top of these steam chest covers. I'll do a quick test fit before I do the next couple of features, make sure that this is going to work. As you can see, it sticks down through the clearance hole in the outer cover, threads onto the inner cover, clamps it all together, and that looks good. It's not loose. It's holding in place. Everything's bottoming out properly, so that looks good. I can get in there and Yahtzee this off now. Per usual with a hex-shaped fastener, I go in partway and then chamfer and then finish parting. The chamfering tool on a hex profile makes it look dramatically nicer and it's super easy to do. It's one of the best little tricks in model engineering is always chamfer your hexes. You can see what a nice little effect that has on the top of that fastener. One last test fit to make sure this is all going to work. With a little fastener like this, you gotta get all the clearances just right. The stud can't bottom out in the top of the fastener, and the stem on the stem bolt can't bottom out against the steam chest cover, or else 
everything isn't going to clamp together properly. So getting all those little clearances just right takes a little bit of forethought. Now I've got a big chunk of scrap round bar from the bin in the lathe and I'm going to make the cylinder head covers. There's four of these. The design of the front ones is slightly different than the design of the rear ones as you see, but I'll start with the front ones which are simpler. They're just a round shallow dish that sits over the front cylinder head and again has a hole in the center for a stud to pass through to clamp it in place. Again, on the real thing, these would have been probably stampings, large sheet metal stamped pieces, or I suppose they might have been hammer formed, but I think they probably would have stamped them. Although, eh, it was 1910, so stamping wasn't so much of a thing yet. I'm not sure how they would have made them, but they definitely would have been sheet metal, not machined from solid bar stock as we're doing here. Now to start by hollowing out the center, I'm going to do kind of a trepanning operation. I've got a face grooving tool with eh, not quite the right profile for this type of operation, but eh, it's brass, so we got away with it. I'm going to plunge in a bit and hollow this area out to save myself a whole lot of work with the boring bar. Because the geometry of this tool is not quite right for what I'm asking it to do, on a heavy cut, it can't go all the way into the center. It stops cutting and starts rubbing because the closer you get to center, of course, the surface speed gets very, very low and the tool geometry starts to matter more and the clearance under the tool here isn't correct for this type of cut. This leaves me with a big stalagmite in the middle that I'll have to clean up later, but that's okay. Even if I had to do that with a different tool, it still saves me a lot of work to rough in the bulk of the shape with this face grooving tool. But in fact, I could face that down with lighter cuts, so I just did a whole bunch of real light passes to get rid of that at the end. And now I can come in with the boring bar and square up the angled sides that were created by that profiling tool that, again, not really designed for trepanning, so it left a weird shaped shoulder on the outsides. Clean that up with the boring bar, then start taking measurements, see where I'm at, and make a series of boring bar passes to final dimension. Once again, the final part is going to be very thin when we're done, but the nice thing is there's no real critical dimension on any of these parts. These are just decorative covers. As long as they fit comfortably over the parts that they are decorating, that will be sufficient. And in fact, that does fit comfortably over the part that it will be decorating. So, job done. And similar to the steam chest covers, we need a hole down the center that is clearance for the stud, except in this case I did make the stud long enough, so that is all going to work out nice. And then I'll deburr the inside and outside edges of those so they aren't sharp. Eagle-eyed viewers will note that I did not stop and chamfer before finishing the part here like I normally would, because we're going to be radiusing the outer corner of these in a second operation. More on that in a minute. And... Oh, no Yahtzee! I ran out of clearance on the parting blade, and I don't want to go and adjust it because that screws up the height of the tool, so... I was so close, though, that I could just kind of fatigue it off of there. Is fatigue a verb? Well, it is for me on Sunday mornings. These are the jokes, people. The rear covers are identical, so I've brought them to the same point. The main difference is they have a great big hole in the center because they have to clear the stuffing box for the piston rod and also the crosshead assembly. This piece of scrap that I'm using for these already had kind of a big hole in it and I'm just deepening it with a half inch drill and that'll give me clearance for the boring bar to come in and finish this large hole in the center. Quick test fit to make sure that's going to slide over the stuffing boxes, and it does, so we are good to go. can part these off the same way, and we'll be ready to once again radius the outside edges of these. Here's the current state of play then. Everything is looking good, except we've got a whole lot of corners to radius. All these decorative covers need to have nice 332nd radii on them. Now, I could do that by holding it in the three jaw like this and expanding the jaws. That's what the drawings recommend. But that's a risky game because these walls are so thin and that much pressure on three points is very likely to distort the part. I have done that before with similar pieces. So I don't love doing things like this that way. However, I happen to have a trick tool for this job. I have my eccentric engineering flexi chuck. This will allow me to machine a specific boss just for holding this part that will expand evenly, much like an inverted collet, and will be able to hold with even pressure all the way around and not distort these parts. Now, you don't have to have this fancy tool. There's plenty of other ways you could do this. A super glue mandrel, for example, would work just fine. But I have this tool, so I'm going to use it. 
If you want to know more about the FlexiChuck, I did a whole video just on this amazing tool. It's a new addition to the shop and it's absolutely perfect for this type of job. A quick undercut there, make sure that the cover is going to be sitting down against the square shoulder that I've just cut on the tool. And survey says, perfect. So that's a nice sliding fit really close and we can expand that inverted collet now and that part is secure. Now to round this radius, I was expecting to have to grind a tool because I'm sure I don't have a 3 30 seconds corner rounding tool in my, oh, look at this. Look what I found in a dark corner of my spare tooling drawer. I don't know why, but I have a 3 30 seconds corner rounding end mill. Amazing. I have no idea where I got this or why it's there, but as the ancient medieval expression goes, never look a gift corner rounding end mill in the mouth. As I've shown before on my channel, corner rounding end mills and also carbide router bits for your woodworking router make excellent corner rounding tools on the lathe. Combined with the flexi chuck, that makes this a very quick and easy job. That beautiful radius created on there, I'll blend it together a little bit with a file just to make sure the tangents are nice and clean in their transitions. And I'm also going to do a little sanding on the front face because the finish that I got with the parting tool there was eh, not awesome. These are going to be visible, so I'll clean those up a bit. And that is looking much, much nicer. Pretty pleased with how those are turning out. And here you see why the flexi chuck was definitely the right tool for this job, because I can quickly release this part. And this is all set up for the other three. Because I have four of these caps to do, it's super easy to pull that one off, put the next one on, and get back to business. And the rear ones, of course, were done the same way. The big hole in the center doesn't change the radiusing goals that we have for our life. For the steam chest covers, of course, we can't do them on the lathe, even with the flexi chuck, amazing as it is. So we're going to have to do this on the mill. But luckily, as I said, I happen to have the exact right cutter for this somehow. I was originally going to file this, and certainly you could file these corners. However, you know, it would have looked okay but radiusing these with a machine cutter is always going to look nicer than hand filing, or at least when I hand file things. The secret to radiusing with a cutter like this is to get it set up perfectly on the first edge and then always cut the rest of the edges on that same cutter position. So I'm not running the cutter around the outside of the part, I'm rotating the part aligned with that fixed jaw and never moving the cutter because it's pretty much impossible to get the cutter aligned on the part exactly the same way every time. It's less important that the radius is perfectly positioned and more important that all four radii are positioned the same way on the part so that you get those nice edges where the radii meet up. That's really difficult to do any other way, especially with filing. Well, that's a much nicer looking set of parts now, so let's get this all assembled on the locomotive and see how it looks. The rear covers slip on there for now. They're going to be held in place by the crosshead rails, which we don't have yet. And then the front covers go on over those studs. Off camera, I made a couple of nuts to hold this in place. And these are just standard decorative nuts. I didn't bother showing you this because you've seen me make these before. Then the steam chest cover cover covers are held in place with the self-sealing stem bolts. A stud and nut would actually probably be more prototypical. They wouldn't use a giant bolt head for something like this, but eh, I like the way it looks. I think it's nice. Well, there we have it. Those are all of the decorative covers on the entire cylinder and steam chest assembly. Those are really nice looking pieces. I think they really tie the room together. And it's really looking like a boat now. I hope you've enjoyed watching me make these little detail pieces. I do like making this kind of stuff. Thank you so much for watching, and thanks especially to my patrons who make all of this Steamy, steamy content possible every single week. Wait, is that going to get me demonetized? If someone's listening, that's not what I meant. You know what I meant. It's obviously... It, mm. Oh, this is the end, isn't it? Thanks for watching.